Thank you for joining us at Church Experience Online. If you'd like to learn more, find out a way to get connected to our community, or help fuel the movement by giving, simply click on the link to our website in the description below. So I was in a restaurant, it was actually Perkins Restaurant, this is several years back, and I'm standing up front uh, by the register where you'll pay, and there was the big glass case with all the amazing looking desserts, you know what I'm talking about, it's just so tempting, they put it right there for you, you know, you think you're done, but you're not, and, and so they had all the pies and everything, and I'm, I'm there, and, and for, for a moment, it was, it was a normal moment, but then everything changed. I looked up, and the guy across from me that's checking us out at the register, I look at his name tag. And, and then legitimately, this is his real name. His name, it says Larry Bird, okay? Like the NBA basketball player, like Larry Bird, old school. I'm like, that's your name? And he's like, yeah, that's what it was like. It was such a cool thing. But it should have been a hint to me to like leave as fast as you can because what happened next, I will never be able to forget. So I'm standing there by the desserts with Larry Bird and I'm paying for my bill. And all of a sudden I, I feel hands on my hips, and it is generous to say that they were on my hips. They were more like in the, you know, the backside. And, and it was a very, it was a very like intimate grab, you know. And I feel a body pressed against me. And I'm thinking, okay, my wife is not in this restaurant. <laughs> I'm there for a meeting. Like she's at home. Like there, it's like just me here in this restaurant. And I feel these hands on me. I feel this body against me. And I'm thinking, I don't know what kind of weird this is going to be, but this is going to be really weird. And so like I slowly and cautiously turn around to see what's going on, hoping, right, that it's a friend that's just messing with you. And I turn around and I see a face that I've never seen in my life before. Some girl's like, and, and I was shocked. I'm like, whoa, kind of thing. And, but I look at her and she's looking at me with like just this horrified look. The, the, all the blood in her face is gone. It's like she saw a ghost. And she's doing the same thing I am. She's like, whoa. And I'm like, whoa. It's just this, this crazy moment. And like, she thought I was apparently her man that's also in the restaurant, but I wasn't clearly. It was just like that awkward moment there with Larry Bird and the woman that's all feeling me up. And it's just like, this, I got to run. You know, I got to get out of here. It's bad. And that's, I can't shake it. I can't get it out of my head. That's the moment. But, you know, she, she thought she knew, right, who she was standing next to. And, and she thought she knew, but she didn't really know. She, she knew that there was a person there, but she didn't know that person. And I wonder how many of us know who God is but we don't know God personally. I wonder how many of us have faith that there is a God, but we don't have friendship with our Father. You know, as you think about this, it's really interesting what the Bible has to say about it. There's actually a statement that just really grabs me in James chapter 2, verse 19. It's pretty straightforward. It says, you know, you believe that there is one God, good. Okay, that's a good thing that you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. And so this, this interesting statement because it's like, you have faith, we're supposed to believe in God, right? Yeah, that's good, but that's also assumed because even those who don't follow God believe, in this case, believe that there's a God. The demons actually are not following the Lord, of course, but they believe that he exists. And so it's very possible, here's the point, it's very possible to have a generic faith, to believe in a God, or to even have what you might call religion without the relationship. To know about something, to have information, to have knowledge, but have no understanding in your heart. To know that something exists and that, that there is someone, but not to know them well. And see, here's the thing. When we talk about prayer in this, in this teaching series, my heart is that you will come to know the amazing joys of a friendship with God. Last week, like we talked about, just debunking the idea that prayer is a have to and a got to, but instead it's a get to. I get to pray. I get to experience God. Like, it's the joy of it. It's the fulfillment of it, and that's what we want for you. So, so here's the thing. In, in your life, as evidenced by your prayer life in the last 30 days, 
as evidenced by your prayer life in the last 30 days, do you just know about God or do you really know God? Do you walk with him? And it's not a like, oh man, I'm not doing it right. You know, someone on the way out of the first service, they caught me, they're like, man, I'm just, thanks, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go try to do better at this and I, I'm gonna, and I, I say, hey man, it's, it's not about like, are you succeeding or failing at prayer? It's a relationship. So it's, it's more like, have I checked in lately? Have I, have I been connected with the Father? Because it's, it's a relationship. It's not a religion. It's not rules. It's not rituals. It's a friendship. And, and if I could just communicate one thing that would be so helpful and life-giving from, from Scripture, it's, it's that, that God wants to be in relationship with you. I mean, he's done everything that he could possibly do to reach his hand out and say, I want to be in relationship. To the extent of giving his son Jesus to die for us on the cross, he's like, I will do anything. I mean, I'll part the sea. I will do anything to reach out and let you know that I want to be in companionship with you because I love you. So, so how do we know God? Like, how does that actually happen? Because I know a lot of us are like, man, I, great. So, so you're probably right. Like, if I look in the last 30 days, I haven't really just hung out with God a lot. I've gone to church and maybe said a few prayers when the food gets served up. But, but man, that's about it. I don't really have that. So how do I come to know God? I know it's, it's like crazy simple. But, but here, here it is. It's, it's a lesson I put in your notes. And I'm going to give you several of them real quick. And so maybe you want to write these down. It might help you or someone around you. So here it is. It's, we know God more through prayer. That's it. I know, I know it's crazy simple, but like here's how you get to know God is you pray. You spend time with God. And so when you pray and when you spend time with God, you get to know him more. So if you want to get to know God more, whether you've been walking with him for a lot of years or you're fresh in your faith, you pray. And here's the next lesson. Maybe if you're writing these down. So we know God, but we trust God more when we know him. We trust God more when we know him. So you tracking with me? So if you want to get to know God more, you pray. But then after you, the crazy thing is once you get to know God more, you start to trust him more because he is trustworthy. So the more you actually know him, the more trustworthy things that you see about him, the more faithfulness that you see in him, the more that you trust him with your life, right? So you, you don't trust someone that you don't know. You can give a certain extent of, you know, trust and belief, but but to really deeply know and trust someone with your life, that doesn't come just haphazardly. That comes when you know them and have a relationship. So the more you come to know God, the more that you can actually trust him. And so sometimes you distrust what you don't know. And so if you feel like there's a gap in the distance between you and God and you're having trouble following him and surrendering to him, perhaps it's because there's a gap in your trust with him, which comes from knowing him, which comes from prayer. And that leads me to this next lesson in your notes is that we live for God more when we trust him. So once you start to know God, you begin to actually walk out his plans for your life to live for him. You start to live for him. So you can become so trusting of God that you actually will place your life in his hands. And you'll, you have to come to that place before you can truly, with abandon, live for Jesus and follow him. You can't do that until you really trust him because otherwise you think God's holding out on you. You're like, God, you're trying to limit me. I can't just do whatever I want to do. Whenever I want to do it, I can't just live how I, I feel the compulse to live. I, no, it's like God is not holding out on you by giving you a path. He's leading you to a place of fulfillment. And so he's saying, trust me and follow my ways, that my way is actually better than your way. But you can't get to a place of trusting him in that until you really know him. But then you trust him and you start to live for him. And here's, here it is. So here's the point of all that. It's in your notes, this final one here, is that, that life starts to change when we start to pray more. Life starts to change when we pray more. When we really start to seek Jesus and pursue him and live for him, that's when life starts to change. All right, so, so do you kind of see how it works? It's like, if I want to see change in my life, then I need to pray. And so if I pray, then I'm going to get to know God more. And if I get to know God more, then I'm going to, I'm going to learn to trust him because he's trustworthy. And then if I trust God more, I'm going to feel confident to follow him and live for him. And when you actually live for God, your life changes. It's amazing. It changes for the better. It's incredible. So if you want your life to change, that's all you got to do is got to pray. You got to pray. You got to start walking with Jesus and you got to start praying. And when you start to pray, you know what? It's amazing. It happens. You come to know God more. And as you come to know God more, you start to trust him more. And like, all right, God, I, I surrender my life to you because you know what? I know you enough to know now that you're for me. You're not against me. And God, I know you enough to know now that your purposes are good and that you're a loving God. 
And you're not out to harm me, but you have a, you have a plan for my future. So I trust you, God. So because I trust you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start living for you and I'm going to follow you. And when you start living for God, because his ways are higher than our ways and his ways are better than our ways, your life actually gets better. And it's crazy how it happens. So, so you pray more because like, man, that was amazing. And so maybe you've been walking for, with God for a long time and, and you discover new depths of this process. And you realize, you know what, I, I want to spend more time with God. And so you draw in and you get closer to God. And as you do that, even though you know so much about God and you've been walking with him maybe for a long time, you you come to a place where you actually know God even better. And there's depths of God that you're like, it's amazing, like who God is. And then you you unearth those depths of God and his character and who he is. And so then you start to trust him with a faith that you've never had before. It's like, okay, God, I've always followed you and had a faith, but now like I'm giving you everything. God, all the chips on the table. God, my life is yours with complete surrender because I know you so much and I trust you so much Now I'm going to really live for you. And so whatever you want in me, God, I'm all yours. And then your life starts to change. And then you draw into God even more because you realize how good. And you can just see that when you start to pray, that's the tipping point. That's what changes everything. And so that was really kind of the genesis of of our heart for this this teaching series is that we want to help people see that prayer is, it's not a got to. It's not a religious have to. A ritual that you follow that's lifeless and cold that are you doing it good or not. It's like, this is life. This is life giving. This is companionship with your father and it's so good we uh dreaming up how we could equip our people to grow in this idea of prayer and there was a a book that jennifer and i came across before god called us to plant this new church and it's called the circle maker by pastor mark batterson he's pastor in washington dc national community church and he wrote this book it's all about prayer and his journey in prayer it's called the circle maker and it was so impacting. And so thinking, man, you know what would be awesome if we could just give this book to everybody at Church Experience. And so that's what we're going to do. And so today as you leave, I'm out at the red carpet. For everyone who would actually have the intention to read this, it's yours. And it's, it's out there just free to you. We just want to invest in you and help you grow in your relationship with God. But instead of just talking about it and, and, and sharing what I've learned from it, I want you to actually hear from, from Pastor Mark himself. And so for a little time here, I, I want you to hear his story. It's incredible. And I hope and believe that it will impact you like it impacted us. Check this out. Fifteen years ago, National Community Church was meeting in a D.C. public school on Capitol Hill. There was nothing easy about our first year. Total church income was $2,000 a month, and it cost $1,600 just to rent the school. On a good Sunday, we'd start with eight or 10 or 12 people. That's when I learned to close my eyes and worship because it was too depressing to open them. To be honest, I didn't really feel like a pastor. The church didn't really feel like a church. I felt underqualified and overwhelmed, but that's when God has you right where He wants you. Why? because it forces you to pray like it depends on God. It forces you to your knees. It forces you to live in raw dependence upon God. And raw dependence is the raw material out of which God performs His greatest miracles. Well, one day as I was dreaming about the church that God wanted to establish here on Capitol Hill, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do a prayer walk. I was reading through the book of Joshua and one of the promises jumped off the page and into my spirit. It says, I will give you everywhere you set your foot just as I promised Moses. Well, as I read that promise given to Joshua, I felt like God wanted me to stake claim to the land he had called us to and pray a perimeter all the way around Capitol Hill. Part of me didn't want to do it because it was a hot and humid August morning, but I had this holy confidence that just as that promise had been transferred from Moses to Joshua, that God would transfer that promise to me if I had enough faith to circle it. And so I drew what would be my first prayer circle, and it still ranks as the longest prayer walk I've ever done. Starting at the front door of our row house on Capitol Hill, I walked east on F Street and turned south on 8th Street. 
across East Capitol and Pennsylvania Avenue. I walk all the way to the Navy Yard and turn west on M Street. And then north on South Capitol Street. I pause to pray on the west steps of the Capitol that face the National Mall. And then I completed the 4.7 mile prayer circle by walking around Union Station and heading home. It's hard to describe what I felt when I finished praying that circle. My feet were sore, but my spirit soared. I felt that same kind of holy confidence the Israelites must have felt when they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground and finally stepped into the Promised Land for the first time. It took about three hours to complete that prayer circle, but God's been answering that prayer for the last 15 years. Since that August day that I drew that prayer circle around Capitol Hill, National Community Church has grown from a core group of 19 people into one church with seven locations around the metro DC area. And God's given us the privilege of influencing tens of thousands of people over those 15 years. But it all started with a prayer circle. I believe that every blessing, every breakthrough, every miracle, every dream has a genealogy. And if you trace it all the way back to its origin, you'll find a prayer circle. Those blessings and breakthroughs and miracles and dreams are the byproduct of prayers that were prayed by you or for you. During my prayer walk around the hill, I drew circles around things I didn't even know how to ask for. Without even knowing it, I walked right by a crack house that would become Ebenezer's Coffee House, which we now own and operate. I walked under the marquee of an old movie theater on Barracks Row that's now our seventh campus. And I prayed around an $8 million piece of property that we now own debt free where we'll build a future campus. If I had not drawn those prayer circles, I don't think we would own those properties. You see, God has determined that certain expressions of His power will only be exercised in response to prayer. Simply put, we have not because we ask not. Or maybe I should say, we have not because we circle not. The greatest tragedy in life are the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. But if you have the courage to circle the promise, circle the dream, circle the miracle, you never know how or when or where God might answer that prayer. Every book has a backstory. There's a moment when an idea is conceived in the imagination of an author, and that idea is destined to become a book. So before I tell you the story of the circle maker, let me tell you the backstory. Up until my senior year of college, I'd only read a dozen books not assigned by a teacher. Most of them were sports biographies with lots of pictures and stats. I just wasn't a reader. Then during my senior year of college, I was on a road trip and I picked up an 800-page biography of Albert Einstein. I fell in love with reading. Well, since then, I've read thousands of books. In fact, I'm running out of bookshelves. But I have one shelf with a few dozen of my favorites. One of them is titled The Book of Legends. It's a collection of stories from the Jewish Talmud, and it contains the teachings of Jewish rabbis passed down from generation to generation. Because it contains more than a millennium worth of wisdom, reading the Book of Legends feels like an archaeological dig. Well, I dug down about 202 pages when I unearthed what may as well have been a, a buried treasure. It was the legend of Honey the Circle Maker, and it forever changed the way that I pray. It gave me a new vocabulary, a new methodology. Well, it was the first century BC and a devastating drought threatened to destroy the generation before Jesus. 
the last of the Jewish prophets, had died off nearly four centuries before. Miracles were a distant memory, and it seemed like God was nowhere to be heard. But there was one man, an old sage who lived outside the walls of Jerusalem, who dared to pray anyway. His name was Honi, and even if the people could not hear God, he believed that God could still hear them. Famous for his ability to pray for rain, the people pleaded with Honi to pray for a miracle. With a six-foot staff in his hand, Honi began to turn like a math compass, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. He never looked up as the crowd looked on. When he was done turning, Honi stood inside the circle that he had drawn. Then he dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven. With the authority of the prophet Elijah who called down fire from heaven, Honi called down rain. He said, Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The word sent a shudder down the spine of all who were within earshot that day. And then it happened. As his prayer ascended to the heavens, raindrops descended to the earth. The people rejoiced over each raindrop, but Honey wasn't satisfied with a sprinkle. He lifted his voice over the sounds of celebration. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns. The sprinkle turned into such a torrential downpour that the people had to flee to the Temple Mount. But Honey still wasn't satisfied. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of thy favor, blessing, and graciousness. Well, the downpour turned into a perfectly proportioned sun shower. Each raindrop, a tangible token of God's grace. Honey was almost excommunicated for his prayer because some members of the Sanhedrin believed that it was too bold. Listen, God is not offended by our bold prayers. He's offended by anything less. God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. And eventually, Honey was honored for the prayer that saved a generation. It was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. The circle that he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol. And the legend of Honey the Circle Maker stands forever as a testament to the power of a single prayer to change the course of history. Remember the promise God had given to Moses and then transferred to Joshua? I will give you everywhere you set your foot. Well, the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and approached the ancient city of Jericho. It had to be both awe-inspiring and frightening. While wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they had never seen anything approximating the skyline of Jericho. The closer they got, the smaller they felt. I think they finally understood why the generation before them felt like grasshoppers and failed to enter the promised land. Well, a six foot wide lower wall and a 50 foot high upper wall encircled that ancient metropolis. The mud brick walls were so thick and so tall that the 12 acre city appeared to be an impregnable fortress. It seemed like God had promised something impossible and his battle plan seemed nonsensical. In Joshua 6, 3, it says, your entire army is to march around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, you're to march around the city seven times. Well, the soldiers must have wondered why. You know, why not use a battering ram? Why not scale the walls? Why not cut off the water supply or shoot flaming arrows over the walls? Instead, God told the Israelite army to silently circle the city. On the seventh day, they arose before dawn, and they circled the city seven times. Then 600,000 Israelites raised a holy roar that registered on the Richter scale, and the walls came tumbling down. After seven days of circling Jericho, God had delivered on a 400-year-old promise. He proved, once again, that His promises and our prayers 
don't have expiration dates. Jericho stands and falls as a testament to this simple truth. If you keep circling the promise, God will ultimately deliver on it. The Jericho miracle is a microcosm. It not only reveals the way that God performed that particular miracle, but it also establishes a pattern for us to follow. It challenges us to confidently circle the promises that God has given to us, and it begs this question, what is your Jericho? What promise are you praying around? What miracle are you marching around? What dream does your life revolve around? Drawing prayer circles starts with identifying your Jericho. You've got to define the promises that God wants you to stake claim to the miracles that God wants you to believe for, and the dreams that God wants you to pursue. Then you need to keep circling until God gives you what He wants and He wills. Now that's the goal. Here's the problem. Most of us don't get what we want simply because we don't know what we want. We've never circled any of God's promises. We've never written down a list of life goals. We've never defined success for ourselves. So instead of drawing circles, we draw blanks. Well, it was more than a thousand years after the Jericho miracle that another miracle happened in the same exact place. Jesus was on his way out of Jericho when two blind men said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stops and he responds with a pointed question. What do you want me to do for you? Seriously? I mean, is that question even necessary? I mean, isn't it obvious what they want? They're blind. Yet Jesus forced them to define exactly what they wanted from him. Jesus made them verbalize their desire. He made them spell it out. But it wasn't because Jesus didn't know what they wanted. He wanted to make sure that they knew what they wanted. And that's where drawing prayer circles begins. It's knowing what to circle. Well, what if Jesus asked you this very same question? What do you want me to do for you? Jericho is spelled lots of different ways. If you have cancer, it's spelled healing. If your child is far from God, it's spelled salvation. If your marriage is falling apart, it's spelled reconciliation. If you have a vision that's beyond your resources, it's spelled provision. Sometimes Jericho is spelled without letters. It's a zip code that you're called to or a dollar figure that will get you out of debt. Sometimes Jericho has the same spelling as someone's name. For me, Jericho has three different spellings, Parker, Summer, and Josiah. Well, whatever it is, you need to identify it then you need to circle it. You can't just read the Bible. You need to start circling the promises. Listen, start praying wisdom around your kids. Start praying power around your problems. Start praying with faith around your dreams. That's what Wayne and Diane did when they got pregnant with their first son. In fact, they didn't just start praying for their son. They started praying for their future daughter-in-law, Jessica, by name, for 22 years, but I'll let them tell you their story. So when my parents were pregnant with me, uh, they prayed over me every night. And uh, they continued to pray for me, the strong baby, baby name, um, all of those things. And uh, when they were doing some reading about uh, praying for your child, they came across this um, book that suggested them to pray for their spouse as well. And uh, so they continued to pray for their baby and the spouse. And in October of 1983, they um, got the name Jessica and continued to pray for Jessica and uh, their baby's spouse. And uh, later in December, they came across a boy name because they weren't sure what they were having a boy or a girl. And they, uh, came about Timothy, and uh, in May of 1984, they had a little boy and named him Timothy, and continued to pray for me and um, my spouse one day, 
I really remember hearing it at our rehearsal dinner and Tim's parents um, at our rehearsal dinner were just sharing uh, about how they had prayed for me for my entire life and basically just you know said that they had this name Jessica that was given to them they felt by God in October of 1983 that was the month that I was born and um, little did I know and little did they know that they had been praying for me every single day of my life by name um, and just incredible to know that my parents-in-law had been praying for me with that dedication and that fervency and prayer for for so long. Now that uh, Jessica and I have um, a little one uh, it's definitely something that we've talked about um, Praying for our baby every night while Jessica was pregnant was definitely a high priority for us. Um, every single day we prayed over her and um, we continue to this day. She's now three months old and we still continue to pray over her every day. And um, no, we have not gotten a spouse name. <laughs> At least not what we think. You know, so you, you kind of, we have this story that, you know, about, you know, how Tim's parents prayed for us. And so it's easy for us to think like, oh, maybe one day that, you know, the, the little boy name that we thought that we were going to use if we were going to have a boy, maybe that would end up being um, her spouse. But I think one thing that we just have to realize is, you know, we're praying very specific things over her and we have no idea how the, those prayers are going to turn out. And when we look her in the eye, um, you know, in, in 22 years, 25 years, what kind of answer to those prayers that we'll see uh, specifically for her. Yeah. Well, a few years ago, I came up with a little formula, change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. You know, sometimes you need to get out of the routine to get some revelation. You know, I'd recommend you take a prayer journal and go on a prayer retreat and begin to discern the answer to the question that Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? But the purpose of getting out of the routine is getting into the routine of prayer. And the key is finding a time and finding a place where you can draw a circle. For Daniel, it was praying through an open window toward Jerusalem. For Jesus, it was walking the beach before dawn. For Habakkuk, it was climbing a watchtower. Well, for me, it's the rooftop of Ebenezer's Coffee House. I climb the ladder, pop the hatch, and just pace back and forth. And one of the reasons that I love praying here is because I feel like I'm praying on a miracle. I want to present you with a 21-day challenge. Now, there's nothing magical about 21 days or 7 days or 40 days. But it's important that you have a timeline in mind and the challenge is simply this. Find a time and find a place to pray every day for 21 days. Now it could be your bedroom at home, it could be a lunchroom at work, it could be 6 a.m. or 10 p.m. But make a prayer appointment with God for 10 or 30 or 60 minutes. Then pick a promise or a person or a problem that you're going to circle in prayer every day for 21 days. You may even want to form a prayer circle with others and pray for whatever is in each other's circles. Now it could be a promise in scripture that you circle every day. Ask God for discernment and faith to claim that promise. You know, it could be your spouse or your kids or a coworker who doesn't know the Lord. It could be a problem that you can't seem to overcome. Keep circling it in prayer for 21 days. Now, does that mean that God will give you an answer in 21 days? Well, for some of you, the answer will be yes. But for others, the answer will be no. But that isn't the point. The goal isn't getting an answer. The goal is establishing a prayer habit. Well, let me leave you with a promise from Philippians 4. And this is a promise that I circle with my youngest son, Josiah, all the time. In all things, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah, that was so good, wasn't it? So helpful.
And you know, I, I'm, my hope is that you and I will together over this next 21 days that we will journey on and pray. And I'm going to actually put that challenge out to us to pray for the next 21 days together. And you know, Jennifer and I came across this before we started this church, and it was just the two of us. We were the only two adults a part of the church at that time. And we prayed. We did the 21-day prayer challenge for you guys together. And it was amazing what God did on the other side of those prayers. And I wonder what God has in store for you on the other side of your prayers that you will pray in these 21 days. And I believe that God wants to do amazing things. You know, I heard someone say that God loves to reward and, and to bless openly those who pursue him privately. And some of us are so caught up on the exterior parts of our lives that we leave the interior neglected. And I'm just going to challenge you to dig deep in these next 21 days. Between now and June 26th, that Sunday, that weekend, let's, let's pray together these 21 days. And I just want to challenge you just to circle some things. And, and, and focus on what's going on inside your heart and your relationship with God. And see what God might do. You never know what God may, may do in your life. And, and here's what I want to challenge you to do specifically, two things. One, to pick one thing in your life personally that you're going to circle. One, maybe a movable mountain in your life. Something that's to you is a, a huge issue. Something that causes anxiety in your life. Some unanswered prayer. Some need. And just circle it. Maybe it's a close relationship. Maybe it's a future dream in your heart. Maybe it's your situation. And just bring it before God these next 21 days every day. Just be faithful each day just to bring it before God and just talk to God about it. Say, God, here's what's going on. Here's how I'm feeling. Here's what I'm thinking about it. And see what God will do. But I'm going to challenge you not just to do that because that would be amazing if even some of us left here the next 21 days and prayed more than we did and we connected with God in that way. But I'm going to challenge you also, in addition to praying for whatever your mountain is in your life, to pray for us together. Because how cool would it be if there's many of us that are out praying for God to move the mountains in our lives, but that we're also praying for each other and praying for this movement of church experience and this new church and what God's doing here and, and praying specifically as, as God brings faces to your minds of the people that maybe you don't even know their names but people you've seen around now and you're getting to know folks and just praying for each other and praying for what God's doing collectively here and all those prayers that are being prayed. So, so the next 21 days, imagine what this could, could look like. You know, you and I, we're praying about our own lives and what God's doing, but we're praying for each other. And I just think that that would be incredible to see what God would do through that. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually. And my hope is that you'll have a continual feast as you sit at God's table in these next three weeks. And, and, and you connect with him maybe in ways that you've never connected with him before. I walked down the steps a few weeks ago after having a particularly hard weekend. And I was exhausted. I hadn't had a lot of sleep. I was tired. And I just... I just kind of walked off, and, and I, was, I just wasn't feeling good. You know you've had those days. Maybe for you it was a Monday, right? And you show up, and, and it's like you just feel drained, and maybe you had a long weekend or something, and you're tired, or maybe it's, maybe it's for you it's just a, a particularly busy season, and you just feel that exhaustion in your life. And I was feeling that. And, and you know what happens when you feel that way? Do you remember last time you felt that way? The devil starts to, to kind of lean in and whisper in your ear, and he tells you about all the things you're not doing right and, and how things in your life aren't going to work out, and, and all the, he just kind of whispers to you all these lies just to mess with you and discourage you, you know, and, and all that stuff, and, you, and you're just down, and I mean, I was standing there just feeling a little bit of the weight of that, and I had, a, I had a hand that just got placed on my shoulder, and I looked back, and it was my wife, and she didn't say anything, she just smiled, and she, and she didn't know all that was going on, she just kind of like, hey, you know, I love you, and, 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 and it, like a moment later, I'm not kidding you, like another hand on my other shoulder, and I looked over my shoulder, and it was Scott Davis, our life group's pastor. And they were both just standing there, and they both just kind of, hey, and just, just put a hand on my shoulder. And I'm like, God, thank you for that. And it didn't mean much to them, but it meant the world to me. And I wrote it down and remembered it later, and I was thinking, like, God, that was, that was you when I needed it, showing me that your presence is there with me in my life, and that no matter what I go through and the highs and lows, that, God, your presence is there. And maybe you don't feel like you have that, that presence in your life of a, of a good friend that's got a hand on your shoulder. And so for you especially, it's important to know that you have a Father in heaven whose hands are, are stretched out towards you, and he's there with you. And he cares about whatever valley you're walking through right now, and he knows all about it. And he's there. You're not alone. And I just want to remind you that God's presence is real and it's with you. And so here's the thing. As we end today, wherever you're at with all that, we're not just going to talk about prayer, and I'm not going to end in prayer like I normally would do. We're actually going to take these last few minutes in this teaching time, and we're going to actually pray. And so we're going to put some prompts up here on the screen for you. And I want to give you an opportunity just to connect with God and just to talk to him and be reminded of the fact that God's presence is real in your life. And so maybe for some in the room, this will be the first time in a long time that you've actually talked with God. Maybe for some of you, this is not a new step of prayer, but I hope it will be the next step, and you can take an opportunity to grow deeper. Maybe you want to use this time to talk about 
with God or reflect on what you've learned today and what you're going to do over these next 21 days or what things you're going to circle. Maybe you want to write some of those down, but this is your time. And if it helps you to have some prompts on the screen of things to pray about and it helps get the conversation going, then please do. But we're going to give you a few minutes just to pray, and then I'll come up and close this in just a moment. Hey, let's pray together.
we hope you enjoyed the teaching. And we also hope we'll be able to apply what you learn to your everyday life. And again, if you want to find out more about us, find out ways to get connected or start giving financially, simply click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for stopping by and we hope to see you in person soon.